commitment that our government has made and a direct investment in this year's budget of $12 million to uh, improve and increase the number of police on our front line. Uh, we've committed this $12 million as part of a comprehensive package to support police. Uh, we will be, across uh, the next uh, three years, uh, seeing 900 people, cadets, trained through the Police Academy here at Fort Larks. We've also uh, launched a brand new You Belong in Blue campaign. And I'm sure that in a moment, Hayley and Bowendy might talk a little bit about why they belong in blue. And I must say, they look fantastic, um, about to graduate tomorrow. Uh, we've also, for the first time, um, uh, beginning in the first term of 2024, uh, we'll be running a schools-based pathway program. Uh, that, as we've uh, seen previously, will be at Featherton Senior College as a pilot. And I'm um, advised that the uh, work with other schools, both in the public system as well as the Catholic and independent system, is progressing really well. And we would expect that that number will grow to include more schools to uh, have more schools-based pathways for police. Uh, and we are also very pleased that in just the last few days, the federal government, Commonwealth government, has approved a labour agreement that now will see uh, South Australian police be able to convert um, expressions of interest from experienced overseas police into actual recruits. Uh, we are in market in the United Kingdom, in Ireland and New Zealand. And we uh, are planning to uh, recruit up to 200 experienced police to uh, rapidly increase the number of police here in South Australia. Uh, we've seen great success in the past and with the uh, uh, coordination of a concerted overseas recruitment campaign and seeing 900 cadets, uh, 900 um, police, uh, people uh, trained here at Fort Largs across the next three years. Uh, we think we've got the balance right between a rapid increase in the numbers and supporting uh, great local jobs for local South Australians who aspire to be police. We've seen over the last uh, month or so the extraordinary public support for our police. And I'm welcoming Hayley and Bowinder into our family knowing that they are uh, loved and respected by our community. And if I can also, as a bit of a um, behind the scenes or a flash, uh, some of the extraordinary uh, um, uh, options that we've got for our overseas recruiting. Um, notwithstanding today's thunder, uh, we live um, by all objective standards in one of the best places in the world. Uh, South Australia uh, is going places. We have an economy which is kicking goals. Uh, we have um, local jobs here for families with a quality of life. Uh, that is uh, not seen in most other parts of the world. So as we have been in market and as we begin to rapidly convert uh, expressions of interest into frontline UK, Irish and New Zealand police, uh, we know that we are welcoming those overseas recruits into just the best part of the world. I'm very pleased to be doing that uh, and very pleased to be seeing this rapid increase in police across the next couple of years. Thank you and uh, welcome to the Police Academy. Um, as you've seen from this morning's dress rehearsal, that's the prelude uh, to tomorrow's graduation of 23 probationary constables, uh, which will bolster our policing resources in both the metropolitan area and the regional areas. Um, maintaining appropriate staffing levels for South Australia Police is critical to us maintaining the level of service that the community expect and the high level of service that we deliver. Um, so tomorrow's graduation will add to those resources. Um, but we are, are at a period in time when our attrition rate is probably the highest it's been for a while. Um, we currently have an attrition of 5.7% of our workforce. And that's uh, really increased because of the numbers of resignations is higher than it has been in previous years. And some of that is down to the fact that uh, we train our police officers very well. They are highly professional and they are well regarded across a range of careers. So other organisations luring South Australia police away from their policing career is part of the job market. 
Um, so that's contributed really to the higher levels of attrition that we're seeing, which means that uh, we need to increase the numbers of recruits coming through the academy. So as the Minister's already explained, uh, we will be doubling the numbers of recruit courses to effectively reach a target of 900 police uh, at the end of the 25-26 financial year. That 900 does include what we're targeting a number of 200 uh, police, uh, and they will be police who have a minimum of three years experience in the jurisdictions of the United Kingdom, Republic of Ireland and New Zealand. Uh, as the Minister has explained, the Labor Agreement uh, has now been signed off, so we are actively engaging with those police in those countries to translate their interest in SAPO into us um, signing them up to become police officers in South Australia over that uh, next three year program. So how far short are you of establishment numbers of your, of your target for the overall police force? How far below that are you at the moment? Sure. So as of the 1st of December, we're 176 police below our full-time establishment number. So you, you could translate to effectively saying we are 176 police short of our target of the full numbers of police we would like to see. So what, that means you need a... What's the full number of police that you would like to see? If I can just refer to my notes. Um, so our full establishment of police is 4,498, so the 176 is 176 short of 4,498. So you're losing about 200 a year in retirements and resignations? Yes. So you, yes, you really need, you're sort of still not quite making up even enough to, to keep up to the number of people leaving the force. So That's correct. So effectively this um, accelerated recruitment program is to maintain our establishment numbers. Is there anything that you think needs to change in terms of, I guess, pay or working conditions, maybe rostering that might retain people in the industry? Uh, we've done a number of things recently. We have an extended hours roster uh, currently within the metropolitan area uh, for police that work what we call response. Um, and response is that active um, um, tasking so they, they work uh, in extended hours roster um, that is very much about balancing our operational needs with the fatigue and um, sleep that comes with working shift work. Um, that is currently under trial. Um, so that's a, a mechanism that allows people to work a much better roster. Um, by working extended hours, they get more days off. Um, so again, that's a consideration. We train our police very well. Um, the academy here is highly professional. So if you look at SAPO as a career, um, there are around 46 different careers within a career uh, within SAPO. So we see that as very attractive to being a, a real good proposition for people joining South Australia Police if they're looking for an alternative are career. You, are you struggling to fill even the, the number of classes at the moment, even the cadet courses that are going through at the moment? Um, we certainly do have a recruiting program that is facing some challenges. Um, obviously we aim to have maximum numbers in each recruit class. Um, sometimes we do fall short, um, but it's very much about balancing, I guess, the type of talent we're looking for uh, to making sure that what we produce at the end of it is um, very professional and experienced police officers. So I think all, in, all industries and particularly policing across the nation is facing some resourcing challenges in terms of getting people to come to the place. And then obviously that higher attrition rate is also meaning we're losing them at the other end. Is 300 a year an overly ambitious target? I don't think so. No, no. We're, we're confident that we can achieve the, the 200 from our overseas program. What that will allow us to do is accelerate those people through the academy. Um, so that means we can achieve that target at the end of the 25-26 financial year in a much quicker rate um, by balancing it up with a mix of the overseas recruitment as well as our own local recruitment. Do you need to look at retention a little bit more that you know, people are retiring leaving the force so there are ways of maintaining them and keeping them on for longer? Oh, absolutely. That, that's a part of our organisational um, discussions all the time. Um, it's not only about recruiting people, it's about retaining them beyond their time uh, in terms of those that choose to leave early uh, and those that choose to may retire just purely by age. Um, so retention is really a bigger factor as recruitment. 
Because okay. we don't lose them, the recruitment numbers don't need to be um, so how do you as well. Propose to retain them. I mean, what is it? I guess that's coming up. Um, consistently as a reason why people are choosing to leave that career early? Uh, it's, well, we, we run exit interviews on all of our staff as to the reasons why they leave. Um, some people just choose a different profession because they want to change, um, not purely because they are disillusioned with policing. Um, there are those that leave for those types of reasons. Uh, but I think as long as we understand the reasons why people leave, um, we can put some retention factors in place. But as I said, it's a very strong consideration of our discussions around having um, procedures and policies that allow us to retain our staff and making SAPOL their career of choice ongoing. There appear to have been a, a spike in time stats over the past year, like an increase, 30% increase in shop theft, uh, almost 30% increase in robbery offences, 16% spike in serious assault. Could you uh, put that down to the fact that you're 176 officers down on your target? I think it contributes to it, um, but at the same time, if we understand those crime stats, then we're in a position to put our policing resources where they're required at, at points in time. Um, we will always have variations in crime, uh, but we understand our crime figures. Our police that are out there on the streets are doing a fantastic job, and where we position those police is all based on the intelligence. But intelligence that comes out of that increase in shop theft, for instance, is the opportunity for us to place the resourcing into that area at that point in time. In the general sense of these crime stats, do they increase? Do they? Do you accept that crime is increasing in South Australia? Yes, yeah, so statistically, that's what's happening. Yes, um, but what again, are, and what are the causes? Oh, I think there's a variety of causes. We could look at cost of living. Um, certainly, that's a, that's a big pressure uh, in terms of just a, a range of community factors. Some of that is perhaps outside our influence. Um, but where we can have influence is making people who commit crime accountable to what they do. In, uh, in terms of how we've seen a horrific incident um, yesterday morning at Gilderton and, and a, a strange doctor that's been left in critical condition as a result of a home invasion, I, yes. I guess, um, what's your message to South Australians about feeling safe in their own home when we've got people running around breaking into properties in the middle of the night and Leaving them there critically. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that is a tragic set of circumstances which we are putting all of our resources into. And it's being led by a major crime investigation branch, and we have some positive lines of inquiry. We are confident that we will hold those people to account, but from a community safety aspect, yeah, it's, it's a horrendous crime and, and a very tragic set of circumstances. But in terms of our effort going towards the people who have committed that crime, it's a full-on effort, absolutely. Is, is, you part of the problem, is part of the problem sort of the revolving door? Do you feel that, you know, police catch them, that potentially put them away, they end up before the courts and then they're let out again? Uh, I, I won't provide too much comment on the court sentencing processes. Obviously, our role is to put those people before the court and we make proper representation about the type of penalty that um, we would see through our prosecution areas, whether that's our police prosecutions unit or the director of public prosecution. So, when the courts impose a penalty, that's something really in the domain of the courts. Are you able to speak to the specifics of the extra resources for this particular investigation? Uh, I can tell you that our major crime investigation branch is taking the lead on it. They are being supported by our district policing teams uh, in terms of putting as much effort as we possibly can into investigating this crime. And in saying that, I certainly encourage any person who has any information to contact Crime Stoppers. But at this point in time, this is a very serious crime and we are putting um, additional resources into that and we are confident that we have some very good lines of inquiry. Is you there any links between uh, an incident at Dutton Terrace in Virginia, for which there's CCTV, and this, uh, the, the Gilberton incident? I couldn't comment on that at the moment, but obviously the investigation team will pretty much look at every possible avenue of inquiry and if there is a link between that then that will be drawn out by the investigation. You said there's some positive lines of inquiry, is there any update as to locating this group of people who have seemed to have broken in? At this stage I can't comment on that but we certainly do encourage anyone that has information to provide that. Uh, there was some footage released yesterday um, but it's still early days of the investigation but every possible effort has been put into it to ensure that we solve this as quickly as possible. There was also a, another fatal crash overnight near Kapunda, bringing the road toll to 107. Yes. I guess, you know, can we get a comment on, on how terrible these numbers are continuing to look? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, every life lost on the road has a major impact. Um, we're now at 107 you know, compared to 66 last year. So that's 107 lives lost on our roads. Um, that, those families as they come into Christmas, are missing those family members. So we encourage everyone to drive safely, drive to the conditions. We've seen some terrible conditions in the last few days. Um, what we ask is people drive to those conditions so that they arrive at their destination safely. Police also nabbed a, a drink driver at Paraka at 0.247. I mean, you know, what does that say about the community's uptake of, of this message to drive safely? Well, that's very disappointing um, that someone will drive with that level of blood alcohol. Um, but what is reassuring is that that person has been caught by the police. They'll now face the consequences of their court actions, their vehicle being impounded, and then losing their license. So what I say is, take all that into consideration before you make poor decisions to get behind the wheel. Are there any common factors in uh, some of the uh, traffic incidents, some of the fatal crashes to the past 24 hours that police are concerned about, particularly age drivers, people involved, for example? We have strong data on what we call the fatal five, and they're the things that we say contribute the most to fatal collisions, whether it's speed, whether it's inattention, um, wearing a seatbelt. Um, so all of those factors are taken into consideration during the investigation of each fatal collision. Um, but certainly that's part of our traffic enforcement program. The police will be out there enforcing the road rules and we encourage everyone to follow the road rules. All right, do you want to talk to the new Thank probationary you. constables? Yeah. Yeah. Haley, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. <laughs> step do you want to ask a question? So what uh, prompted you to uh, join us? Um, so firstly, I was I left school in 2018. Um, then I joined the Child Protection um, and was looking after vulnerable children and their families. Um, and then I wanted to join Safe Hold through family and a job. So um, that's what piqued my interest in Safe Hold. Um, and also in Safe Hold, they've got a family and children investigation branch, which I'm hoping to join later on in my career. Um, and then Safe Hold obviously have a diverse range of um, roles within the job. Um, you can go country, metro, there's just so much that Safe Hold offers. Yeah. Child yeah. protection, you think you can make more of a difference being on the force? Yeah, I think it was good experience for me as well, joining Child Protection first to see a different side of things and then as well on the Safe Hold side as well. Great. Yeah. Yeah. You came all the way from your state to uh, sign up? Yes, yeah, so I moved from New South Wales, especially to Safe Hold. Uh, it was a 10 month process, but it was worth waiting. Uh, as, as a child, it was my dream job, so I did my, you know, I just researched and I found out Safe Hold stood out, out of other interstate police, so I said I'm moving to South Australia. What, what is stand it? out? I mean, it's the flexibility, first of all, because I had the option to stay at home with my family, come to the academy every day, very compared to other states. They have to stay at the academy, you don't see your family for six months, which is, you know, a lengthy period of away from family especially having kids, you know, young kids and uh, misses. It's, uh, you're not put off by the, by the different meanings of the job. There are obviously a lot of challenges and it can be quite a, a trying and demanding task. That's, that's not a concern. No, I work in the Department of Corrections before, so I think I've done my job well. I've retained uh, well experience from New South Wales. I did almost a year in New South, uh, South Australian uh, Corrections as well. So I think I have uh, plenty of experience to bring over to Safe Hall and uh, you know deal with crime and you know help with the you know, community. Obviously, you feel feel it when a, a police officer is uh, fatally shot. That must drive home the dangers of the job. I mean, it was sad we lost you know officer and our families are aware of it. So so you know the risk of the job. So and you have in the back of your mind when you're applying for the role, it's the front line. I'm in the Army Reserves as well, so I know the risk, you know, dealing with the, you know, when you go overseas, uh, you know, Afghanistan is no different to, you know, to dealing with criminals in the country. Great. Thanks, everyone. Just Thank very quickly, uh, Minister. We have some yeah, Thank sure. you. Yeah. Doris, you want to go first? Or? Joe, obviously, the um, pediatrician involved in the home invasion.